Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm Aaron Hollander. I'm the program coordinator of the Craft Teaching Program. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you here. Can everyone hear me OK? I've got the, this thing where you see. I'm delighted to welcome everyone, uh, students, faculty, staff, uh, friends of the Divinity School, alumni, and very special guests to this celebration of the program's fifth anniversary. Uh, in these years since our first, very first Dean Seminar in winter of 2012, uh, the, the Craft Teaching Program has hosted over 100 pedagogy workshops, which have been attended by 226 students, 24 of whom have earned their certification in the Craft of Teaching. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, we have just a short program for you this afternoon. It shouldn't be any longer than, than half an hour. Uh, I'd encourage you, uh, if you'd be more comfortable, to find a seat. We have some more seats. If there aren't enough, there are uh, more seats outside the closet. But um, feel free just to, to gather around as you see fit. Before I introduce our first speaker, I have just a couple of acknowledgments. This, uh, this celebration wouldn't be possible without the collaboration of the Divinity Students Association, the Dean's Office, uh, and its wonderful staff, and the Divinity School Alumni Affairs, all of whom make uh, the, their crucial partners of the of teaching and make what we do possible. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you. <laughs> Second, I just want to acknowledge the teaching task force of the Divinity School, which is a rotating committee um, that oversees the, the programming and long-term planning of the of teaching program. Um, this year, uh, the, the teaching task force is composed of Dean Richard Rosengarten, uh, Dean Perry Owens, uh, Professor Simeon Chevelle, Professor Josh Elsner, as well as our interim director for the undergraduate program in religious studies, Emily Cruz, um, and myself and our associate coordinator for craft of teaching, Maureen Kelly, over here, who's just completed her written exams. <laughs> Now I'll have two, two more very important acknowledgments that will conclude our program. Um, but first, it's my very great pleasure to introduce the person whose vision and inaugural leadership transformed this in-house, robust, but flexible um, pedagogy program that's calibrated to the contemporary needs of religious studies from a brilliant dream into a, uh, a nationally recognized and ever-developing reality. Margaret Mitchell is the former dean of the Divinity School and the Shayla Matthews Professor of New Testament and Early Christian Literature. She's a passionate and innovative educator, and without a doubt, she's one of the finest teachers whom I've ever had the privilege to study with. Welcome, Professor Mitchell. Thank you, Aaron. Well, I'm not speaking as a founder of the program. I'm speaking as an eyewitness from the beginning. In, as the evangelist Luke would put it in Autoptes Autoptes. <laughs> the genesis of the craft of teaching program began with a simple question. How to ensure that the Divinity School's graduates will have the tools, experience, and sensibilities to be outstanding educators across the landscape of higher education and a range of other professions in society. Partly this was a concern for our students, each of them and their futures. We wanted them to have progressively independent teaching experiences while also being equipped to thrive in them and to learn from them. And we wanted them to be able to answer the question on the job market, sure, coming from Chicago, we know you can do research but can you teach our students? And partly it was grounded in the larger picture of the future of our field and its importance for humanistic inquiry, for public policy, for civil life, as well as into its own propagation. At orientation between 2010 and 2015, I would ask the incoming class, how many of you are here because of an outstanding undergraduate or graduate instructor. Maybe I'll ask it now. How many of you are here because of an outstanding instructor? And I'm in your company uh, as well. Her name was Jean McGowan. <coughs> Principles. 
we decided from the beginning that the program should be founded on the following main principles. It must be integral to the academic program, knitted into it and truly intellectually grounded, rigorous and lively. Not an add-on, not just another thing to do, and not a burden, but an excitement. Second, it must be attuned to the great variety of work done here and in the academic study of religion in terms of subject matter defined by religious traditions or subjects or periods of time or types of source materials, literary, artistic, ritual, music, etc. Must be attuned to difference in discipline, history, philosophy, literary studies, anthropology, sociology, etc and also to the range of methodologies represented in Swift Hall for the work that we do. Third, it must not just be theoretical, but practical. Not just hypothetical, but real. How, when, and where, and to what kinds of students, and for what kinds of purposes do we teach the study of religion? And fourth, it must not only describe the state of teaching, but it must provide critical tools, or tools for critical analysis toward changing the face of higher education today and into the future. As we looked around, we saw opportunities. First, Swift Hall is already a place of vibrant, ongoing conversation about our work, and many fine pedagogues on this faculty and elsewhere in the university eager to talk about how they envision <coughs> and enact models of teaching and learning. Hence, the craft of teaching really is about being a bit more intentional and overt about things that go on here all the time. Second, our wider campus, and especially the Chicago Center for Teaching, Director Becky Chandler, and now Director Bill Rando, who's here with us today, and its exceedingly valuable programming with which we could partner and collaborate in designing a religious studies particular focus. Third, we knew right away we had a fabulous opportunity in our own alumni who embody some of the highest principles and practices and who represent in themselves that great variety of expertise and institutional and social contexts that characterize the academic study of religion in this country. From the very first, alumni like Rebecca Raphael, Rebecca Cha, they're not all named Rebecca, uh, <laughs> Mark Wallace, Daisy Machado, the 12 who assembled for a consultation in April of 2013, and non-alumni like Professor Jonathan C. Smith, and just two weeks ago, Ellen Muehlberg, Professor Ellen Muehlberg of the University of Michigan, have helped make the program so smart, vital, inspiring, and challenging. And John and Jane Holm, partners who understood how vitally important the craft of teaching is, not only to the mission of the Divinity School, but to the wider society, to inculcate intelligent and reasoned discussion of religion in the public sphere, and not just transfer reliable content or even learned commentary, but also to model tools for how responsibly to discuss and analyze religion in public. Beyond that, John and Jane, as our committed partners, pushed us early on to think bigger, plan further ahead, and be even more ambitious about the program. I remember in particular a meal on Memorial Day weekend in Highland Park, where John kept pressing me with the question, where do you want to be in 10 years? and where do you want to be in the next 10 years? It is because of the Coleman's intensity and experience, including in some similar highly successful philanthropic commitments at John's alma mater, Cornell University School of Engineering, the Coleman Leadership Program. It's because of that that we are here today celebrating the five-year anniversary of the founding of the program. Now sure of its secure basis, existing platform and footprint, while also due to the leadership and ideas of the faculty and of our inaugural program directors, Brandon Klein 
and Aaron Hollander, with a program that is true to its founding principles <coughs> and that is already moving beyond them in many ways, including the arts of teaching sequences, attention to media in teaching, and to media forms of the craft of teaching program itself, including our very cool and successful blog. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> I even did it. I don't read about blogs. Um, and third, building in issues of leadership and institutional finesse and varieties of professional roles into the program. Teaching isn't only within the walls of the classroom. And each of the alumni and others we have brought in has dazzled us with their creativity, their keenness, their humor, and their humanity in opening up their classrooms and offices to our gaze and our inquiry. The craft of teaching has worked because of this collaborative spirit. There is no master teacher. We are all apprentices together in the quest to learn how to teach in this moment at this time, with these students, etc., as we together hone the craft that it is our privilege to exercise. I want to extend my special thanks to John and Jane Coleman for believing in this program and for investing in its present and its future. And I would like to thank you personally for teaching me so much about how to live in multiple time zones at once, <laughs> how to act in the present and plan for the future, combining integrity of vision with flexibility for growth. Because of your vision, the Divinity School's Craft of Teaching program is not only true to its founding principles and ideals, but it is exceeding them. And in the future, I anticipate it will be all the greater. To John and Jane, with heartfelt thanks. Our next speaker is William Rando, a renowned educator and scholar of pedagogy, who is now also the, the director of the Chicago Center for Teaching after serving for many years as the founding director of the Yale Teaching Center. He's also an associate dean at the college and a truly valued partner for the Path of Teaching program, guiding us in, our, in enhancing our programming and collaborating with us as we do so, contributing our resources to the overall strengthening of the cultivation of educators at the University of Chicago. Um, welcome, Dean. celebration and for giving me the chance uh, you know to do something that we don't always do as often as we should which is just uh, express our gratitude and uh, warm feelings for the others on campus who make our experience uh, all the more wonderful and rich just by being here and that's what I want to talk about uh, today uh, sort of maybe a little bit of a, a view from the outside of um, what I think having the craft of teaching program uh, on this campus uh, has meant to the whole university, which uh, maybe you're not aware, but I'm going to try to sum that up. Um, so I've been here about three years now. I, um, but I've known about the craft of teaching program uh, since since before I got here. Uh, for one reason, um, Elizabeth Chandler, uh, my predecessor, who also happens to be a longtime colleague and one of my best friends in the world, um, talked about the craft of teaching program when she was wooing me. So you're being used to woo people. <laughs> That's a good sign. Seriously. Because when somebody in a position like mine 
is trying to decide, should I come to a campus? You know, so, uh, one of the questions is, well, what is the environment like? Where is their support? Where are their sources of inspiration? And the craft of teaching program was one of those sources of inspiration uh, that eventually uh, helped me decide to come here, which is one of the, uh, I would say, best decisions uh, I've ever uh, made. Um, it's also kind of funny and surprising then, as, and I, I just remember this as I was putting these comments together, that the very first program of any kind that I went to on this campus was a craft and teaching program. It was on the fourth day that I was here. It was a Friday. And uh, the craft and teaching program had invited uh, Leah Shopka mm -hmm. from Indiana to come and lead a conversation called uh, What Does It Mean to Think Like a Medievalist? And uh, I, had, I had actually, I, I, I knew of Leah's work because she's at the uh, History Teaching Project at Indiana, they do amazing stuff. And so four days here, and I came to a, a, a program run by the Craft Teaching Program. And, uh, and all of the things uh, that I had heard about the Craft Teaching Program, including in my conversations with Margaret, uh, were uh, shown to be true. It was a dynamic conversation, it was rigorous, it was interesting, it was challenging, ideas were raised, some, uh, some remained, some were left behind. It was great. Uh, and this is the kind of collaboration that Elizabeth had described uh, uh, to me that, that the teaching center had with the graduate teaching. I'm, I'm thrilled to say that since then, that collaboration has continued and some of the most dynamic programs that the Center for Teaching has offered have, have been offered in collaboration with the Craft of Teaching. In, uh, in, 1990, in 2015, we invited Craig Nelson here to give an incredible all-day workshop on the intellectual and ethical development of college students. And then in 2016, we invited Michele Di Pietro to come and do a half-day program on identity in the classroom. The point I really want to make here is that having a, the craft of teaching uh, program on campus has enriched my ability to think about the variety of ways that we can think about what great teaching is. And it has made an enormous contribution to me, to my staff, and then to the larger university. But of all the contributions, I think, uh, and this is more personally, uh, of all the contributions the craft teaching program has made, uh, the greatest actually has just been in the people I've gotten to work with and the conversations I've had. And I'm talking about Brandon, who was the inaugural director, and Aaron. Um, in each case, we would have meetings that were scheduled for 30 minutes, and they would then go for two hours. Because we had so much to talk about. And those conversations have, uh, have deeply enriched my experience here. And I hope in the process, uh, the experience of everyone who teaches at Chicago. So in sum, I just want to say that, so I've been teaching and in this uh, business of running and building teaching centers for 30 years. And I've worked with many school or division or department-based teaching centers, mostly in medical schools and engineering schools, so they have a long tradition of that. The tradition is not as common in divinity schools. And it is a great uniqueness of the University of Chicago and the Divinity School here that we have such a program. And it's um, that in itself makes it stand out. But what makes it stand out even more as, 
has a school-based program um, is how this program, and Margaret alluded to this, has enhanced the culture of the place and the experience of everyone who teaches and learns within it. I have never seen uh, a school-based program have, have, such a, have such an impact as the craft of teaching has. And I will say, and this just occurred to me about 10 minutes ago, that as a university center, what we're really trying to do in our work is to try to recreate what you do in multiple departments and multiple divisions. Because, which is to say, bringing, bringing all that we know about pedagogy, some of it general, some of it practical, into the intellectual life of what it means to be a scholar, be it history or literature. And so um, we learn a lot by looking at what you do. And the university, uh, I think, is very grateful for that. And I certainly know that I am. So it is an honor for me to work and learn and your company. Congratulations on five years. And I hope for many, many more. Thank you. Third speaker uh, can't be with us in person today, um, but has sent along remarks for the occasion. And once you hear who, who this is, it will be it's, it's fitting in a way. But, um, she's sending sending her contribution from afar. Rebecca Raphael received her PhD from the Divinity School in 1997, and is now associate professor of philosophy and a single service professor in the humanities at Texas State University. Professor Raphael has been involved in the craft of teaching in several key capacities. She was our Dean Seminar guest in autumn 2012. She participated in our graduate program teaching initiative sponsored by the Wabash Center. And uh, she was the Craft Teaching's inaugural blogger and virtual residence, <laughs> helping us to expand the significance and the value of the program throughout the international alumni network and indeed throughout the field as a whole. Her remarks today will be read by Carolyn Angla, uh, president of the Divinity School Association. Welcome, Carolyn. few brief remarks of uh, gratitude on behalf of the Divinity Students Association. Um, and this will echo some of what Aaron has already said. But first, thank you, uh, Dean Mitchell, for your vision and leadership in establishing the craft of teaching five years ago. And thank you to Dean Rosenberg and members of the administration who have continued to support and um, offer their commitment to this programming. I think I speak on behalf of many students, past and present, when I say that the craft of teaching is a unique and highly valued uh, program here at Stuart Hall. Second, I think that the craft of teaching, this more personal note, um, captures a principle of community leadership that has guided my own work in the Community Students Association. And that principle is simply that we are each responsible for creating the community that we wish to be a part of. And I think the craft of teaching is especially valuable to me because it takes that principle one step further. The structure of the program embodies the idea that um, we are, as future educators, responsible for the profession that we wish to be a part of. We don't just haphazardly stumble into this thing called education, although it's fair to say that the craft of teaching may not absolutely prevent us from stumbling. <laughs> but this is exactly my point. The craft of teaching creates these peer networks in which um, we can think about the development of our professional community. So on that note, I want to thank Aaron and Maureen and Marshall and Brandon and any other uh, student leaders that have so efficiently facilitated this space for communal learning and professional self-reflection. So now I will shift to the remarks prepared by Professor Rebecca Raphael um, from Texas State University. You may feel free to call me Professor for the remainder of the <laughs> Centrality of Curiosity. <clears throat> Dean Rosenberg invited me to write some reflections on the Craft of Teaching program on the occasion of its fifth anniversary. 
My involvement with the program in its first year came through Dean Mitchell, who asked me to give the Dean Seminar in autumn of 2012. My gratitude to her for that initial invitation is best expressed through what I have to say here about the program. <coughs> in Hyde Park, calling something a conversation is sufficient commendation. <laughs> but I want to be more specific about this conversation called the craft of teaching. For the person who gives a Dean Seminar, it is both retrospective on one's work as a teacher and also prospective toward the participants' future work as teachers. My engagement with the program has taken various forms over several years. The seminar, the Wabash workshop in April of 2013, and the blog. And through each of these, the program itself has sustained that retrospective and prospective reflection. That is, it brought aspects of my teaching and its context to a level of awareness and integration that I had not achieved earlier, absent this conversation. I would like to track a trajectory of reflection that I owe to the program's discussions as an example of its vitality and value. When Dean Mitchell invited me to give a Dean Seminar, the program was only two quarters old. At first, I was uncertain what to do. I guess they hoped we figured out how to teach, I remarked to a friend, <laughs> for I still did not feel that I knew how. My motivation for advanced study was never a desire to teach or to mold others. I simply wanted to know, ideally everything. Bridging extreme curiosity to the social forms of the academy was not an easy task for me. While the first work part of my graduate school years went uneventfully, I struggled, struggled with whether I belonged in the academy. At the Dean Seminar in the discussion period, I told a story about a discussion with one of my doctoral advisors. The academic part of the conversation over, I heard out that I didn't think I belonged here. He replied, Prescott Ciencia. <laughs> the abrupt shift to Latin, I asked him to say, Prescott Ciencia, the Chicago motto, knowledge for knowledge's sake, that's you. Oh, yeah, that is me. But at the time, I gave little thought to transmitting knowledge to teaching. So I came to teaching with the assumption that research and writing cultivated my knowledge and teaching attempted to transmit knowledge. It's typical enough mapping, it's, a, it's atypical enough mapping of the epistemic domain onto the conventional divisions of faculty life, research, teaching, and service. It's also wrong. Early in my <laughs> career, I felt extremely frustrated with students who were poorly prepared and a few who expressed hostility to the intellect especially to the academic study of religion. This felt like a bottleneck. I could not pass on knowledge if no one would accept the handoff. There is some truth in part of this view, but I found that I put the components together in an unproductive way. Tasked with rendering an account of my teaching to divinity graduate students, I realized that saying what I just wrote above would not help them. So I focused instead on the practices I had developed to address the students I had. Then I saw that slowly over the years, I had found my way to a different practice under which lay a different basic image of teaching. The discussion of the Wabash workshop pushed me to articulate this. As I listened to faculty newer to teaching, air the frustrations we all have, I formulated an observation about the different ways in which students can be ready or unready for our classes. Intellectual ability, prior preparation, socialization to the academic mores, and curiosity are independent variables and easy to conflate. Weak preparation is not a lack of ability, nor is good preparation necessarily high ability. So socialization to mores is not intelligence and can actually be superficial, and so on. And I realized, literally when I was sitting with the group in Swift Commons, that if I could pick only one of these in a student, it would be curiosity. A curious person I can teach, and do so in a way that will build up the other areas. 
incurious people who have ability, preparation, and socialization become at best imitations of the surfaces of intellectual life. Curiosity provides the emotional commitment to know. From it, the inner voice of thought emerges. You can hear this inner voice, or the lack of it, in someone's writing. In his 1999 speech, The Perils of Indifference, Alec Wiesel argues that indifference is not a kind of response, but rather a non-response to the humanity of the suffering other. So perhaps the opposite of knowledge is not ignorance, but incuriosity, a refusal or suppression of the desire to know. If curiosity is the emotional binding to intellectual quest, that eager attention to the real, to the horizon of my current knowledge, then in curiosity, in turn, severs that connection. It is the intellectual correlate of indifference. Thus, my reconfiguring act of teaching is this. Knowledge is always in people, or it's nowhere. Knowledge is not the real itself, but our modeling of it. We can only build up knowledge in ourselves through our own dialogue with the methods and traditions of modeling the real. And we can only build up in others, our students, by working from who and where they already are. I do not mean this as a long way of saying student-centered, a pedagogy that I think fails adequately to turn students beyond themselves. It is rather a knowledge-centered approach for both teachers and students, but one that recognizes that we have to build where we are with the tools we have. If I don't teach student, if I don't teach the student before me, because he or she does not already clear some bar of knowledge, then I am refusing to build knowledge in that person. Press paciencia or not. Perhaps wiser people than I have always known and practiced these things. In any case, the craft of teaching program has made me a better teacher. It has supplied for current students something that was lacking in my own graduate training, an extension of intellectual conversation to teaching, and thus a formative incorporation of that significant part of our lives into a broader intellectual project. It has created conversation across cohorts of the Divinity School, one that brings our habit of dialogic thought to teaching as an essential practice of a knowledge-seeking enterprise. The local and virtual facets of the program enrich and sustain this conversation. If I read the atmosphere of our world correctly, the practices of knowledge now face severe headwinds, and many of us are feeling our way to a response that will keep intellectual life alive and accessible. At least from wherever you are, foster curiosity and fight its opposite. In its five years of ex existence, the Craft of Teaching program has become one local community for doing so. exciting. You can go today. There's a new post up from one of our early career alumni, crafttofteachingreligion.wordfest.com. Before we conclude, and we're just about ready to conclude, we have to take a minute for two more uh, two more acknowledgments um, of people without whom the, the craft of teaching program would not, could not exist. First, the students, whose dedication to the craft of teaching is the lifeblood of this program. Um, it's because of them that the program thrives as part of the culture of the Divinity School day by day, week by week. As I mentioned, 226 different students have participated in these programs over the past five years. And while I certainly can't name them all, and I imagine you would throw me off stage with a cane if I tried, um, I do want to recognize the 24 who have earned their certificate in the, in the craft of teaching, carrying this training into all corners of the we have, uh, in, the last, uh, in the last five years, um, 
certified students from every area of the Divinity School, almost every area of the Divinity School. Um, <laughs> and they are from Anthropology and Sociology of Religion, Aisha Polo. From Bible, Kelly Gardner, Sinyong Kim, Andrew Langford, Jordan Spornick, Ramla Sekhmet. From Ethics, Michelle Chevalier, Willow Langell Swenson. From History of Christianity, Sean Hammond. From History of Judaism, Eric Dreff. From History of Religions, Charles Preston. From Islamic Studies, Elizabeth Sartell. From Philosophy of Religion, Joseph Steininger, Jason Cather, Russell Johnson, and Anil Mundra. From Religion and Literature, Yulia Tsutsarova. From Theology, Maryam Raduba, Tarek El Gendi, uh, Ekaterina Lomperis, and myself. We have now three more to add to those ranks. Um, who are here with us, they'll receive their certificates in person. So I'd like to ask you as I read your name to come on up and get your certificate, and then we can acknowledge all of these students and, by extension, everyone who's participated in the craft of teaching after that. So first, Cameron Ferguson from the Bible Program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, from Islamic Studies, Timothy Gutman. Thank you all. I don't know what we're doing, but maybe just a photo. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll wrap this up. <laughs> now, if your name wasn't Red, we have many more exciting programs <laughs> including this coming Monday's uh, very exciting session on public religious literacy in secondary and post-secondary uh, education right here Monday at 4.30. Please do come back. So finally, I'll turn things over to Dean Richard Rosengarten, Dean of the Divinity School and Associate Professor of Religion and Literature, for our last and especially important acknowledgement of the evening. Welcome, Dean Rosengarten. really good at spelling things. And you also know how really good I am at being brief. Um, but I have two things to say. First of all, I have a gift to give, and then I have a toast to offer. But before that, because he's in the room, I want to say there is one more religion and literature person who got his teaching certificate, and that's John Howe. And I think we should acknowledge him. Um, wonderful words, accurate words, beautiful words have been said by many people for which I'm very grateful and I'm especially grateful to Aaron for emceeing this event. Uh, in relation to this, we wanted to memorialize this in a way that we hope will be particularly uh, meaningful to the Coleman's and to that end, we have a gift for you which is a book of photographs and statements from people that have emerged from the craft of teaching. And I don't dare open this because I'm a mall, but I'm going to give it to you. But what's inside looks like this. <laughs> and it will be available afterwards. So first of all, with thanks. I want, to, I want all of you to join me in raising a glass. Um, John Coleman and Jane Coleman have been in my life for 16 years, and it's been pretty great to know them for all this time and to have their presence. Um, the way I think of John and Jane Coleman is actually a slight addition to Rebecca Raphael's remarks, which is the university's motto, Prescott Scientia Vita Exquilatur, has that little caesura in the middle, and they're the ones who make the caesura put go together. Belief in knowledge to enhance life. And I want to say thank you for bridging this is your for us. So that is all from us.
Thank you all for being here. Please enjoy the wonderful food and drink. This book I'm going to put on a music stand up here. You should feel free to leave through it. And see you soon. Thank you all.